Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Jose Martin. I am uh, a I'm in the activism team at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. At certain points, um, I may take my cap off. And if you see me taking my cap off, I'm not speaking for my employer. But if I'm wearing my cap, I'm probably also not speaking for my employer. Let's be real. Um, so I have just been tapped to moderate. I also am a biased moderator. I have uh, my own you know, presentation and, and pieces of the presentation, although I'll probably try to answer questions after I let these two fine gentlemen uh, answer them. Uh, and uh, please uh, also, this can either be uh, a, an environment where there is conflict and, uh, and spent feelings, or we can have a, a collegial and supportive environment where everybody kind of gets to say their piece or ask their questions. So hopefully we'll have a lo lot of time for Q&A. Uh, but uh, please try to you know, be respectful of the speakers and respectful of each other. Um, I'm going to first let the two other panelists uh, give their uh, introductions. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Starchy Grant. I work on the <clears throat> Tech Ops team at the Electronic Frontier Foundation with Jose. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say uh, thank you all for choosing to come to the most fun topic at <laughs> all of Dragon Con. Uh, you, could, you could be doing pretty much anything tonight and this is what you chose to do uh that's amazing um and yes uh, as as you've already heard twice this is a topic that a lot of us have very strong feelings about and for good reason um so we're gonna try to keep it chill um you know personally i also have my own biases i I am a proud American Jew, and I'm also a fierce critic of Zionism, and I know a lot of us wear these kind of competing hats, and uh, we're, we're not, we're not going to be here to, to yell at each other about who deserves to live and die. We're here to try to inform each other, and um, I think that that will make for a good panel. Hi, I'm Phil Cornell. Uh, I spent 26 years in the Navy. I'm now a defense contractor. And one of the things that we're doing, what we call DIME games or whole government games, DIME standing for diplomacy, information, intelligence, military, economic, you know, the different elements of national power, um, and taking on issues of what is the effect of influence operations. So trying to get our arms around it. As you can imagine, it's like putting your arms around a big block of jello. And you squeeze hard and it just kind of, well, it gets messy. Um, so we do what we can there, but um, um, I have encountered people who really are specialists in there, and I'm going to try without um, identifying them, uh, their um, position on, on, on some of these things. But I also have to say, uh, the opinions I express here are strictly my own. They do not reflect my employer uh, or the Department of Defense. Uh, so, first of all, I wonder if we can start with a little bit of the framing, um, the framing of the general issue, and then who are the actors uh, and what are the kind of purposes that they have engaging specifically with digital media, with, with online media. And I think, you know, in the description, we're talking about traditional media versus social media. I don't think that that is as strong of a distinction anymore. So we could talk about digital media generally. Um, obviously, we'll be, we'll be talking about social media platforms a lot of mm -hmm. the next hour. So if y'all want to, um, want you to pick it up? Sure, yeah. So uh, this is, uh, as we've already hinted at, this is just a, a topic where um, it, it's, th there's no getting away from bias. Um, and a lot of the biases that we encounter every day are generally invisible. Um, certainly, if you're mostly engaging with any one source of media, that's going to have a strong bias that uh, that it's not generally readily pointing out. Uh, it's not announcing this is my lean and this is why I'm telling you information with this framing. Uh, when you look at this particular topic about this conflict, I mean, I mean, even if we look at, for example, the title of this panel uh, that that carries into a particular framing that, for example, I think most Palestinians might disagree with and. Uh, many people who are uh, bolsters of the Israeli government's position uh, would tend to agree with more. Uh, another uh, another great place to look at the kind of framing that a presenter or a, an information source is giving you is where they start their narrative. Um, if, if you are 
hearing uh, a description of the situation that starts the clock on October 7th or 2014 or 1993 or 1948 or the year 70 CE. These all give very different uh, stories, uh, radically different, uh, not necessarily uh, black and white, uh, but just very different from each other. Um, so these these are <clears throat> extremely useful things to watch out for, uh, again, both for, for uh, traditional media and essentially any source online. Uh, if you're looking at you know a, a single tweet or Instagram post from somebody, it, it might be a little bit harder to spot these things. You might have to go back on their timeline to, to get more information. Um, but those are uh, those are usually the, the kinds of places I try to look for first to try to get a sense of where somebody is coming from and how they're framing the issue. Um, that's what Philip did. Yeah, so the, um, you know, just to frame it properly, yes, yeah, so the events on October the 7th was a rather enraging to the, US, to the Israeli government, and they had to respond, and it doesn't matter, you couldn't just like, let it sit around. And then the question was, uh, how would their response um, change the perceptions of uh, nation and non-nation uh, actors around the globe? Um, the actors in this case is, you know, Hamas, to some degree, Lebanese Hezbollah, uh, which are both uh, proxy uh, forces for Iran. And it was assessed early on in open source. I'm not saying anything from 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 anything. You know, you, you, New York Times and other places that the motivation behind uh, the attack was to try and sabotage the uh, Abraham Accords that were trying to reach additional uh, Arab nations in the region. And Iran saw that as a threat that they would be essentially surrounded by these other countries. And lo and behold, in the last two weeks, the leadership of Hezbollah uh, admit, I'm sorry, not Hezbollah, Hamas, the leadership of, of, of Hamas have come out and, and said, yes, that is why we, we launched the attack and we wanted to have an, a, a um, over response so that we can then uh, poison pill the uh, Abraham Accords. Um, and we can talk a little later about uh, whether that is uh, effective, but the key is there are multiple channels uh, where this information is coming out, uh, both inside and outside of Israel, uh, the Gaza Strip, uh, uh, um, uh, up to the north, et cetera. So there's multiple channels where this is coming in, and then there are there, uh, um, the information operations uh, by Iran and other uh, non-state allies. Um, so uh, in terms of framing for, for me and how I you know, kind of approach this, um, I, I, I think that there is some truth, you know, I, I have some agreement with that. I think that there, is, uh, there are normalization um, agreements that are happening or you know, uh, uh, in the works between Israel and Saudi Arabia, Israel and Morocco, Israel and the United Arab Emirates, um, and the like. Uh, but there was also you know, a long-time siege of Gaza and uh, an increase in Israeli military action in the occupied territories, uh, particularly in the West Bank, um, leading up to that throughout the year of 2023. Uh, and there was also very clear intention, um, I think, from the Israeli government uh, to push a further and a harsher um, uh, doctrine against the occupied territories, Gaza and the West Bank, um, than it had previously accepted or than it was at at that moment. And I think that the resistance uh, of Hamas and its allied forces, it's a, it was a coalition of armed groups, the vast majority of which are designated as terrorist organizations by the United States and Western powers, um, had uh, therefore, you know, they had some level of pushing back before it was too late. I don't necessarily, you know, I'm not necessarily somebody who thinks that Iran plays as big a role um, or ha it's, it's principally a proxy uh, question for, for Iran. Um, but I do think that the actors 
then include the Israeli government and sections of Israeli civil society, which is variegated and complex, that includes the tech sector in Israel, uh, along with uh, uh, the settlers and the kind of settlement-based uh, organizations. I think that then there's also the allied governments um, that, that ally themselves with Israel. So the ones that I will be talking most about, um, besides the Israeli government, would be the German, UK, and US governments. Um, and uh, and then, you know, there are the platforms, right? And so there's the online, kind of the mainstream, traditional, you know, corporate, liberal or conservative, but still corporate press, uh, the New York Times and the like, all of which function online. And then there's also, you know, X, which I call Twitter. I'm not calling it X. Um, <laughs> Meta, which controls Facebook, uh, Instagram, and, and a few others. YouTube, TikTok, um, and YouTube, of course, is owned by Alphabet. I think you need to pull the microphone closer to yourself, gentlemen. Sorry about, about that. Right here. Sorry about that. Um, so, so those are some of the actors. And I think, you know, when we talked about the framing, uh, Starchy mentioned the framing. And I think the reason that the framing is important for Israel, that it is Israel, the Israel-Hamas war, is because Israel has very consistently, in uh, the traditional press, in its public statements at the United Nations, in its statements in English, um, less so in its sta statements in Hebrew, pushed the position that everybody in Gaza is responsible for Hamas, and therefore retaliation is a collective question. They will engage in collective punishment against the people of Gaza. Um, and then I think, you know, there are a series of different actors in the Israeli government right now who very clearly want to and state you know, their case that they want to seize the land that Gaza is on. And it is a lot easier for them to eliminate a population if they can argue that that population are all terrorists, right? Are all something. So for, for, for you know. I, I want to clarify what you just sure. said. That's the position of some elements in the Israeli uh, Knesset, but it is not the position of the Israeli government. It is the position, I think, of the interior minister uh, and uh, the finance minister, the finance minister in particular, who comes from the settler movement. So, and and he is he has said that you know fairly explicitly that they want to take he wants to take Gaza as property of Israel, and then reallocate that land to Israeli citizens, not to the people currently on it. There is currently no place, of course, for them to go. But we, we, we can get into that a little bit. But this, is, this, this framing question then, you know, is very important for the jump off of how things are communicated on social media. So maybe we can start to talk a little bit about some of the tactics that are being used in terms of communicating their, the various messages of the various sides and maybe miscommunicating them. So maybe we can, um, Sarchi, do you want to get started on content moderation? Uh, sure, yeah. So uh, I think maybe coming into this topic, what, what seems like the, the most obvious approach and the biggest problem is uh, what we call coordinated and authentic activity or bots where uh, different actors are coming in and swarming social media with fake accounts and amplifying either misinformation or controversial messages. Uh, but in some ways, um, certainly in this conflict, not just since October 7th, again, we're, we're talking about when you start the clock on this conversation, uh, but going back over the last decade or two, um, a, a no, possibly a bigger issue has been uneven content moderation. Um, we see a lot of content from uh, Palestinians and their allies taken down across different uh, different social networks. Um, the uh, the Israeli government actually has something called the Israeli Cyber Unit, which uh, part of their uh, remit is to go out and make these content takedown requests, uh, not just for threats of violence, but for inflammatory political statements. Uh, they brag about compliance rates from the providers such as Meta of up to 90%. And of course, there's, there's nothing remotely like that within Hamas. Um, and they would, if they were to spin up a, a comparable sort of framework, again, because 
Hamas, Hezbollah, and the Iranian government are all designated as terrorist organizations by the US government where these corporations operate, uh, they would see probably 0% compliance. Um, so that is whether whether it's right or wrong, that is uh, completely uh, asymmetric. Um, similarly, um, Israel has a uh, I mean, the 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 simplest way to explain it in English is a long-standing practice of propaganda uh, going back about a century. Um, and this is not necessarily slanderous. Uh, I don't mean that in a bad way. This is essentially using the word that the uh, the first Zionist Congress used. It was very popular among radical circles 100 years ago to say propaganda in a positive way. Uh, and then after the state of Israel was incorporated um, and modern Hebrew, uh, came into vogue, uh, they came up with the term Hasbara, which means explaining. Uh, and that's the word that you'll hear now. Uh, while it means explaining, the, it is very explicit that explaining to outsiders in the West means getting the Israeli cause taken up, not explaining the facts. Um, sometimes that does mean sharing facts, sometimes it means sharing falsehoods. Um, and again, uh, it, it's it's not necessarily that actors like Hamas or Hezbollah would not want to do anything like this uh, out of the goodness of their heart, but it is extremely asymmetric. Uh, Israeli has well-funded government agencies. They have allies in, in the U.S. tech community and obviously uh, U.S. lawmakers. Um, and U.S. civil society from groups like the ADL, APAC, and uh, an even larger group, uh, KUPI, the Christians United for Israel, uh, which is, uh, at least in terms of membership, by far the largest of the three. Um, what we have seen on the other side of things is we've seen that kind of coordinated in an authentic activity I mentioned. But it, it's not happening from Hamas. It's not happening from Hezbollah. There's a little bit happening from Iran. Uh, there's more of it happening from China and Russia, who don't necessarily care very much about what happens in this conflict. Uh, they're mostly more interested in trying to uh, sow more instability in the US. Uh, so they aren't necessarily going out and spreading in misinformation as much as they are amplifying any points of friction that they identify online. Um, and yes, I, I, I think I've said enough. We'll leave it there. So the key is these information operations, whether mostly by Israel as described, but also by other actors, really don't have the effect a lot of people think they do. They really just um, reinforce people's pre-existing perspectives on things. Um, it's very rare that if you could get like some sort of kinetic dramatic event combined with the information operation that you can move the needle. And, um, and it's like a short term effect. And then it, the needle goes right back to where it was uh, before. Um, so it is important if you're, you know, you're a government or society that you pay attention to these uh, operations, particularly over time, because that's where they really have their effect is over time. You know, we've seen this in academia and other places. There's it's, you know, shifting people's perspectives over time. But in terms of like some sort of dramatic shift, you know, one day because of the thing <clears throat> pops up, <clears throat> not really going to happen, particularly if you have a problem with what they call truth decay. You know, like no one knows what the heck is going on. So it's kind of a wash to a lot of people. But you also have a problem uh, when your credibility has been damaged. And we saw this with the uh, hospital strike early on in the conflict. Um, turns out it was uh, a uh, Hamas rocket. Um, it's pretty extensive uh, 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 evidence that it was that. Um, 
and that you know there's other things like that that undermine the credibility of the sender in those cases and then uh, again pushes people back into their previously existing um, corners and so um, overall this is something that you do need to pay attention to in terms of information operations you don't just let it go um, it's not going to be dramatic but it will have an effect over time uh I, I'm not prepared to speak to the Hamas rocket on the Al Shifa hospital, but I do recall that the 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 result was that that was I believe the evidence showed that it was the IDF. But at this point, the IDF has bombed so many hospitals in Gaza that it's really the point is almost moot. Um, I would say, yeah, particularly when they're using the hospital as human shield. So goes back. You know, we can go back and forth about this. All, we all, we all we certainly can. Uh, there, the IDF is frequently currently putting Palestinians injured or dead on their vehicles as human shields. We know that they are actively using Palestinian uh, prisoners and hostages as human shields in the West Bank and in Gaza. Mm -hmm. But just to to speak to this content moderation question, so. For me, I, I broke it down a little bit. I'm thinking Meta, I'm thinking, you know, uh, Twitter. Um, Meta uh, had, you know, there's not a lot of criticism, as far as I recall, on, the, on Meta taking sides before 2016. Uh, but in 2016, Israel uh, started to introduce a legislation to the Knesset that was specifically pointed at Facebook, saying that if uh, Facebook did not start to abide by Israel demands for takedown requests that uh, Israel would pass legislation that would that would ban Meta basically from operating in Israel. And so from that point on, uh, the Israeli Ministry of, of Justice, uh, which has a cyber unit and the IDF, which also has a cyber unit, uh, has a few cyber units that are that are quite notable, uh, started making their takedown requests. I think about 90 percent of them are are uh, are accepted and, and those things are taken down. And there was an outcry. Right. There was a pushback. Uh, eventually, uh, from Human Rights Watch, from Access Now, and from a number of other uh, uh, NGOs that said, you are clearly taking down more pro-Palestine content or content from Palestinian creators uh, and taking down less pro-Israel content content from Israeli creators. So, so Meta was very insistent, we're going to fix this, uh, we're, we're going to solve this. And in 2022, they, uh, they brought in a third party organization, it was the, the Businesses for Social Responsibility, to do an audit to say how much uh, is this true, that we, how much are we actually censoring uh, Palestinian voices more or Arab voices in support of Palestinian voices more than we are the other side. And uh, the BSR report said that it was happening, it was excessively asymmetrical and imbalanced. Uh, and that same year, later that year, uh, the the chief information security officer of uh, Meta was hired in, and they were actually a member of Unit 8200, which is the most notable of the cyber units of the IDF. Uh, much of uh, Unit 8200 has been around for um, quite a while, and many of its veterans have actually been an integral part of the growth of the tech sector in Israel, um, as well as uh, kind of the enjoining of sections of the Israeli tech sector with the with you know Silicon Valley. So something like eighty five, at least eighty five tech firms have been found founded and created by veterans of this uh, unit eighty two hundred. Nevertheless, criticism for Meta's uh, censorship and asymmetrical uh, treatment on its on its content moderation continued. For the next couple of years, uh, they insisted at the beginning of the uh, the current conflict. If we're thinking since October of last year, uh, they insisted that they were going to do better about this. Uh, Human Rights Watch in December put out a report uh, alongside and with uh, uh, the support of um, I think it's called the Arab um, uh, the Arab uh, Association for the Advancement of social media and a couple of others that said that the content moderation policies had not become symmetrical yet, had not started to balance out at all, and that there was overwhelming evidence that the vast majority of the censorship was going against Palestinians and people who were supportive of the Palestinian side. In a, a uh, attempt to solicit uh, examples, they found over a thousand examples and uh, all but one were pro-Palestinian 
um, perspectives or Palestinian perspectives that were all taken down uh, on Instagram and on Facebook. Um, there was one pro-Israel voice that was, that was also taken down. And even Human Rights Watch's own solicitation for examples was flagged uh, by, as spam by, uh, by Facebook and by Instagram. So, uh, you know, Meta has not been succeeding in this regard, right? And there is, there's also, you know, there are a few other things at play. One of the complaints uh, has been that there are specific policies one of the complaints is that there is automated uh, censorship and takedown, and that the automated um, the automated censors are a more able to pick up Arabic than Hebrew because there's a lot more Arabic content because there are a lot more Arabic speakers um, online, and so the automated uh, machine learning we won't call it AI um, <laughs> the machine learning software is able to pick up things in Arabic much faster than Hebrew, uh, but it's also exactly what Starchu is uh, alluding to. The Israeli Defense uh, uh, Defense Ministry and the uh, IDF and the Israeli Ministry of, of um, Justice, uh, through its internal referral unit, uh, does issue lots of demands for takedowns, and then says, "If you don't take these down, we will ban um, this content, at least in in Israel within uh, Israel." There is no one that is equivalent a similar government uh, that can do the same thing on the Palestinian side. The Palestinian Authority. The, obviously, Hamas, which was the which was elected back in two thousand six um, in in Gaza, uh, certainly not any other organization that is designated a terrorist by the countries that that Meta has to operate in and is based in. So there's this massive asymmetry that continues, um, and that's just Meta. Twitter obviously uh, is a mess in all ways. So there is uh, there is a lot of censorship that is happening in Meta. So, I, uh, just, so uh, let's just stop for a second there, right there on, on, on X, Twitter, whatever you want to call it. Right. To say that there was no um, content moderation of Twitter before oh, the I didn't, current I didn't, regime. Yeah. I didn't say that. Um, so, you know, there's there's a uh, uh, you know, there's quite a bit there. Um, and yes, the new ownership has a diff, you know completely different uh, philosophy on, <laughs> on 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 these things. But um, you know, it appears to be moving to, more towards a marketplace of uh, uh, of ideas. However, you do have you know national sovereignty, right? Israel, Israeli government is a sovereign nation, and they're going to use their uh, elements of national power to uh, to their advantage, and to, to the degree that. Uh, Hamas did not design a comprehensive government structure uh, in place. Um, you know, it is actually one of their vulnerabilities because they, you know, they're they're not not really running the country. They're using it as a as a mechanism to uh, um, constantly uh, uh, attack uh, Israel. So. Um, it's you know similar to like all the construction material that was sent into Israel and now it turns out to be all these tunnels. So, you know there there are disadvantages of redirecting your resources away from proper governance. Um, but Israel, you know, it's a sovereign nation. Now I'm I you know like I'm shocked shocked to hear that Israel is using its national power to and the fact that they are willing to ban you know the platform if they don't comply with their national law. I'm, I'm shocked. I tell you. The, well, there's law that hasn't been passed yet, but but I, you know, you can see that we do have a balanced panel. Um, Starchy, <laughs> yeah. No, before, I before before I get to you, Starchy, I do want to just um, mention that just in just this year, uh, Meta's takedowns have actually included, without appeal, um, the uh, within our lifetimes, which is a offshoot of Students for Justice in Palestine, mm -hmm. based in New York. Uh, I often attend their protests. Full disclosure: I am also an anti-Zionist Jew. That is my subject position. Um, they recently took down SJP NYU and SJP Cal State LA. Uh, and then they also recently, without any uh, option for appeal, took down the Cradle, which is which considers itself a West Asian media news media source um, that has been uh, obviously covering the conflict quite a bit. So uh, start you if you want to continue. Yeah, no, I, I, I just uh, just to respond quickly to Philip, I, I, I don't think anybody uh, here is trying to suggest that either uh, Israel or Hamas would be expected not to use their resources uh, to their, their best advantage in this conflict. Uh, 
it, it's more that we as observers need to be aware of the asymmetries. Uh, that, that's what I want to make sure everybody, everybody takes away, regardless of their own personal perspective about the situation. Um, and a, a couple of other things I want to respond to there, uh, just very briefly, I, I think you all pretty much got at this on X slash Twitter. Uh, yeah, very different approach, generally speaking, but not entirely. The bigger complaints there have been less with content moderation than with the opposite, than with uh, not being reactive to hate speech. Um, and uh, that is what it is. That That is where they are on that. Uh, and then another very interesting um, development from Meta this year, which I think does tie into the um, the Students for Justice for Palestine account takedowns that Jose just mentioned is a new policy for moderating uses of the term Zionist, which uh, I, I do believe it is very well intentioned. Um, they are uh, certainly trying to get at uses where things are trending toward hate speech or, uh, you know, either using the term as a stand-in for Jews. Um, the, the problem is that, uh, A, looking at those things requires a level of nuance that we've really never seen from Facebook moderators. Um, and that they don't have the staffing for. They, they don't. They don't pay people to sit and look at each post for twenty minutes. They pay them to look at each post for about twenty seconds, if it even gets to human review. Um, B. Uh, it, it comes also at a time when the um, the IHRA definition of uh, anti-Semitism is being enshrined into law, in including here in the state of Georgia. And that does directly conflate uh, anti-Zionism and criticism of the state of Israel with anti-Semitism. Um, and again, you're you're looking at a panel with at least two people who are both Jewish and and critics of Israel. So uh, there, there's obviously a problem there. Um, so uh, these are. Um, to me, questionable moves. Um, if it if it is true, and we don't know for sure yet that this is how uh, Meta ended up removing those accounts, uh, I, I think that would be a, a, a big red flag for that policy. Uh, the 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 other uh, part that I wanted to mention quickly about Twitter was that uh, 972, you know, a quite some time ago, I think 2017 or 18, did reporting on uh, Twitter's very fast removal of content when Israel uh, requested re uh, removal of content um, that was pro-Palestine or considered, you know, counter to Israel's national interests. And Germany has also done so. Germany has specifically uh, worked very closely with uh, Twitter to also take down, you know, get takedown requests expedited um, and uh, move a lot of pro-Palestine content, especially from within Germany or for a German audience taken off of Twitter. So, so I wanted this to- This kind of goes to the whole definition of what do we mean by Zionism and anti-Zionism? Because, um, you know, the, we, we've often heard from uh, the three uh, uh, combatants uh, or the three elements, you know, Iran, uh, Lebanese, Hezbollah, and Hamas, that um, Zionism means the continued existence of Israel, right? Whereas I suspect these two gentlemen would basically say, hey, I don't have a problem with Israel existing. I just want them to tone down uh, their behaviors towards their immediate, uh, their, their immediate neighbors, right? <laughs> but the the but but that becomes I mean that becomes the key thing I mean it's called cognitive dissonance you know or or, or definition creep what do you mean by uh, Zionism and so uh, Germany or other nations may very well be removing these things because uh, they're basically saying uh, Zion you know Zionism means the existence of Israel needs to be wiped out okay well then there's probably grounds for something like that to be removed 
if if you have a different definition of uh, uh, of Zionism, all ears. But I I I'm kind of understand what the Arab streets version of, of Zionism is. Or I, I, I will. I took off my hat. Um, I'm not <laughs> going to say exactly my position at this moment. But you you did not correct, characterize my position exactly correct okay. on the question of Zionism or Israel. Um, but I will uh, but start you. I'm going to I'm going to point to you. I do have an, uh, another tactical question that I want to get to in a second after we settle this. Settle what is once and for all <laughs> Zionism and. Uh, but I want to just state very clearly, as an anti-Zionist Jew who comes from a family that is made up of anti-Zionists, um, that is as Jewish as anybody else, uh, I'm half Jewish, of course, uh, it still makes me <laughs> as Jewish as a lot of Jews, um, that most people who are called Zionists are self-designated. It is a political ideology and is a self-designation. So whether it is Christian Zionists who make up a majority of the population of Zionists in the world, by membership numbers of groups like Kufi that was mentioned earlier, or it is Jewish Zionists or anyone else who supports the, the what I would say is Jewish supremacist claim to the land that uh, was formerly the Mandate of Palestine, um, that Zionists are a self-designated political ideology. And of course you can use it just like you can use, you know, communist or fascist as a slur against a wider Spectra, uh, spectrum of the population, but I don't think that that's the majority of who is who it is used for. And Starchy was really was chopping at the bit, and I'm sorry that I. <laughs> oh, it, 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 yeah, no, uh, that 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 was uh, that was a, a good intro. Um, I would say it, it's worth keeping in mind there are, of course, there are different definitions of Zionism. Um, some are religious. Uh, most most people involved in Kufi take an evangelical. A view of Zionism, they they want to, uh, they want to see, uh, they want to see the uh, the biblical state of Israel, biblical kingdom of Israel, return to the land to bring about the end times. Uh, personally, I don't think that makes a lot of sense. Um, but if that's your belief, then good luck. Um, <laughs> there are many. Uh, many spiritual Zionists who don't really care about the state of Israel one way or the other, uh, but they believe they, they've read the Torah and they believe uh, that Jews have a spiritual connection to that homeland. Um, again, very different from what we're talking about. Uh, when it comes to the state of Israel, and not necessarily a lot of its political support, which is largely coming from those evangelical Zionists in the U.S. Um, what we're really talking about in a lot of ways is a settler colonial project. And this, uh, this was laid out very clearly in the founding documents of Zionism. Many of the, uh, the Jewish settlers before World War II were actually very um, anti-religious leftists, um, and they had no interest in spiritual or religious Zionism. Uh, however, they they might not have had the uh, the most enlightened ideas about race, um, and there was this real concept of Palestine as a terra nullius, a, an empty space that people could just come and settle and turn into their perfect society. Um, if you look at United States history, you'll, you might see a lot of parallels there. Um, uh, you, there was certain motivation in 1948 the, for all that, right? That, after there, 1945, there, there, yeah, the motivation for a lot of yeah. Jews changed and the, the relationship to so e between even the, the rest of the Jewish public even, even and for those, changed uh, significantly that's right uh, even for those non-religious leftists right their own survival was kind of a motivation in all that now where does that go from there you know the, the old saying is you make peace with your enemies right you kind of have to work that out but if you have different elements to say no we must establish this greater Zion well that that's certainly a barrier very there, but I think we need to go back to the uh, the topic. Oh yeah, sure. So <laughs> uh, the, the topic. So aside from the Nakba, um, the 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 other tactic I want to specifically pinpoint is um, 
sock puppet accounts and the spreading of misinformation because we haven't touched on that mm -hmm. and it has been such a, a it is always a part of conflict maybe you know you can talk a little bit about that um but like uh if we can keep it to seven or so minutes as part of the conversation just so we can get at least 10 minutes yes. of q a um because i know we have a hard stop uh, at the end of the hour yeah so so you you have these um with the democratization of the technology and cape and access capabilities you have the ability to quickly generate these <laughs> sock puppet uh, accounts as you as you uh you know describe them um you know rapidly and therefore i wouldn't be surprised at 1099 or the other organizations units out there are trying to find these things and and remove them um and then for the consumers of the information from from there um how much credibility can you really give to you know one of these things that just pops up out of out of nowhere which goes back to my earlier comment that um these information operations really don't move the needle uh rapidly if you let them sit and fester then they do over time yeah i i think that is that yeah. is uh likely there's there's a, a lot of truth to that i think one thing to take away is just to make sure that you're shoring up your critical thinking skills when you're when you're interacting online when you're reviewing any source of information, whether it's the New York Times, the Washington Post, Fox News, some rando on TikTok. Um, just think about like, what is the framing? As we said, what's the framing that this person is providing for this information? What are they including? What are they leaving out? What, you know, what else have I heard from them? Why are they telling me this? Don't just read or watch the, the single uh nugget of information that they're providing think about everything that they're leaving out uh two uh two cases of of these that i'd like to talk about one is um i think Haretz was the was one of the first publications to start talking about stoic stoic what is a uh an israeli company that created a series of you know legion of, of sock puppet accounts for both domestic and foreign influence um and uh, the well, majority of these accounts were attended, intended to be in the United States. So what they've revealed, among other things, uh, in Haaretz's reporting, as well as NBC has, you know, finally come around to covering it, was that, for example, uh, they, uh, Stoic was creating, partially using machine learning, we're not calling it AI, once again, um, but machine learning to automate creating new websites and new social media accounts in particular, for example, uh, fake African American U.S. accounts that were to specifically speak to, according to Haaretz and the other reporting, black Congress members in the United States. And one of them was your own Senator Warnock. Uh, so uh, it's especially worth uh, worth mentioning. The, the The efficacy, of course, of it is is up for question because in most cases, the Congress members that they were trying to to reach were Congress members who already vote very solidly with Israel, and it was not something to necessarily influence, although there may have been questions of kind of bolstering their votes and their positions, because some of the others included Hakeem Jeffries and uh, Richie Torres um, up in New York. I'm born in Atlanta, but I do live in New York. Uh, and uh, so, you know, these are people that didn't need to change. Their positions didn't need to change, uh, but this did bolster them on social media a little bit. Um, the other, uh, so, one slightly okay news but news about this was that meta and open ai realized that their software was being used for this purpose and actually did massive takedowns of hundreds of accounts that they found to be sock puppet accounts tied to stoic twitter did not and those accounts and those posts remain on twitter so um the the, the other report i wanted to quickly mention is from an israeli civil society group fake reporter fake reporter uh, was cataloging especially activity on Telegram and WhatsApp. And what they found was that on the one hand, uh, Telegram had cut a lot of the designated terrorist uh, uh, groups in the, in the Palestinian occupied territories, cut off their Telegram uh, accounts. So they had an information dissemination that was run by Hamas uh, before October 
of, of uh, 2023. And that was taken down. And then there was a, a series of others that were kind of resistance-based that were taken down. I think some have, have cropped back up since, but uh, for the most part, Telegram did what Western governments would want. However, the uh, fake reporter also cataloged some 70 um, different uh, uh, chat groups and accounts on WhatsApp and Telegram that were predominantly in Hebrew, predominantly for Israeli and settler audiences. And it was extremely insightful, like insightful with an I-N-C-I-T-E. They were uh, <laughs> saying extremely grossly anti-Arab uh, and anti-Muslim things on them. They uh, were showing weapons and how to use them. They were posting fake news that claimed, uh, that made claims about a specific Palestinian owned business even if it was an Israeli Palestinian owned business in, you know, the, the, the 67 borders, uh, uh, as well as uh, trying to incite violence against specific individuals and in specific times, and even listing places and times for, uh, for demonstrations with weapons uh, against so-called terrorists to happen. So fake reporter, uh, you know, wonderful, wonderful uh, thing to check on and stuff, but um, fairly frightening stuff that Telegram, uh, WhatsApp, which is a meta, um, a meta entity, uh, were continuing to be used to push pogroms against Palestinians, including in the 67 borders. So um, if either one of y'all want to wrap up a little bit, maybe we should get to Q&A uh, in the last 10 minutes that we have. Yeah, I think maybe we could we could go to questions. Yeah, do we have questions? Seeing that it's uh, balanced up here, let's yeah, try to see the Hello. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's working. <laughs> um, one thing I've noticed I was curious about is when we went back and did the uh, assessments of information operations used by the Russian government against the American population, uh, I've definitely seen things shared by my Israeli friends that occasionally seem like they wouldn't have been made actually by Israeli intelligence because Israeli intelligence is better than this. <laughs> and I look at these things and I was thinking to myself, is this also a situation where the Russians are going out or maybe the Chinese or any other group to create fake accounts so that later when they want to push a narrative within Israel of the Palestinian territories, they're doing it. Is there any evidence of this? Or can you just assume the Russians and the Chinese are always up to something nefarious, so it's OK? <laughs> Let's put it this way. Uh, it is part of Russian doctrine for disinformation operations. And that's as far as I'm going to go. <laughs> and I would also I would add on, on another side, one thing I've been hearing is people either uh, disappointed with or kind of gloating over how bad the Husbar has gotten in over the past year. Um, I think uh, that a lot of the actors within Israel have kind of gotten cocky and they've gotten used to speaking to the internal audience and are not really aware of how poorly things are landing uh, in the U.S., for example, uh, with, with a lot of the, the sort of stunts and messages that uh, that they've been using. I have not heard of any evidence. I would absolutely suspect that it was the case, though. Um, you know, and it goes back and forth, right? Like it's a constant kind of tug, tug and, and pull from the West versus, you know, some of the other poles in the world <laughs> who are creating sock puppet accounts for sure and, uh, and pushing things. Thanks, Thanks. Uh, among the more traditional uh, media organizations, you know, I'm thinking uh, old BBC, NPR, Al Jazeera, maybe even. What organizations do you think are doing a better or worse job of managing the flow of disinformation and getting it what's really happening? <laughs> <laughs> Not a huge fan of NPR's reporting of late, but. Uh, Me neither. Um, I think the key message, I think all three of us will agree here, that you need multiple sources yeah. because uh, they all come with their own biases. And, um, you know, then there's a question of, of how do you establish that when they're saying something to you, how much uh, should you um, take it to heart, right? How, how, how truthful is it, is it really? And therefore, uh, that's, you know, like a relationship over time, like, you know, hey, is, if someone you know lies to you all the time, probably not a good friend, right? Um, on the other hand, um, 
people have different perspectives and may misunderstand something. So you, you know, just like with friends, you go to more than one friend about a particular topic. Same thing with your uh, your news feeds. Um, you, yeah, if you if you're trying to find out what the truth is, uh, what was it from Babylon Five? Um, you know, truth is a three-edged weapon, our side, <laughs> their side, and and potentially what actually occurred. Um, so you need to do, you know, you, you need to do your homework. And in this um, proliferated information environment, all the more reason. I would just add, um, 100% agree with that. Two, two specific sources that I've been going to, not necessarily because they are the the most truthful, but because they have the uh, the biggest fire hose of information, have been Al Jazeera and Haaretz, um, and they both clearly have their own bent. Haaretz is actually pretty interesting because it it does publish a very wide array of perspectives from within Israeli society. I would also say um, pay very close attention to their sources. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the worst misinformation towards the beginning that allowed for uh, arguments and claims by politicians and other press um, sources uh, very early on were uh, pushed very heavily by the New York Times and by uh, President Biden and by uh, a lot of the other mainstream corporate press. Uh, but the sourcing was either directly from the Israeli government or it was fairly unsourced. It was, uh, it was one Israeli soldier that claimed to have uh, have seen you know 40, uh, 40 beheaded babies that didn't exist, uh, which ballooned into reporters and and the president uh, among others lying, uh, saying that they had seen a photo that didn't exist, and then retracting it. The White House retracted that statement. The New York Times had to retract uh, a phony uh, claim that there had been massive sexual assault. They did their own report on their own report, and then found that. It was scant evidence, and it was extremely poorly, uh, poorly uh, reported on. But there is plenty of evidence that there were atrocities oh, yes. conducted against civilians yes. in those uh, uh, settlements on the border. Yes, and so, um, and this is where the the whole truth decay comes into play, right? You have this one exaggerated claim, which certain elements use to try and dismiss all the other things. It's kind of like Germans saying, "Hey, we never exterminated the Jews." Because we were starving ourselves, right? That kind of nonsense out there. So you got to be really careful about uh, about uh, uh, your your sources and um, think critically. Next question. Yeah, yeah, I would love to. We have, we have <laughs> quite a line, so I want to get through all of y'all. Um, so personal experience on still on Tumblr, which is its own dumpster file over <laughs> social media. Um, wow. <laughs> but in like the last two weeks, been getting a lot of spam messages of like promoting various GoFundMe's of mm -hmm. like this, you know, account that's created two days before. And it's like, hi, I'm stuck in Gaza. Please donate to this thing. And I just wondered if you guys had any comments regarding the moderation and checking of like GoFundMe and similar like fundraising stuff in this aspect. Because there are obviously are legitimate ones, but then there's also that kind of thing. Absolutely. Uh, great question. I don't have the best answer, but Star is uh, ready for it. And yes. Uh, GoFundMe has actually been doing a great job with this in particular. They have a dedicated team to uh, Gazan fundraisers. Uh, so they've been doing a really good job on vetting these. Um, I, if you do see that the account was just created, and uh, you know it's only been around for a day or two, they might not have had a chance to check it out yet. So maybe give it a little bit more time before you donate or reshare it. Um, but yeah, they, they have a, a page, uh, obviously I, I don't remember the URL off the top of my head, explaining the extra betting that they've been doing. So that, that's been really good to see. I'm a prince lost in Gaza City. If you give me, <laughs> I can get my millions of dollars out of Zurich. <laughs> Uh, yeah, would each of you mind just uh, framing how you arrived at your own perspectives, like in 30 seconds, so I can understand better? <laughs> uh, I uh, I come from a uh, I come from a left wing family. Um, I 
and pa my mother's Panamanian. I was in Panama during part of the war. It was the first time that I ever visited um, my family in Panama, my grandfather and others. Uh, I went through U.S. checkpoints uh, and then spent the rest of my life hearing about checkpoints in the West Bank. Uh, an earlier, in an earlier era in Gaza, um, I uh, saw unexploded ordnance, uh, and I saw the mistreatment of my grandfather, 100% Panamanian, uh, in front of me uh, uh, by by an occupying force. Uh, so, you know, that was a very early indicator. Somebody also once said that so this is you in, check in Panama. Yeah, and so in 1990. Ah, so, okay. so. You know, somebody once said that uh, you check the side who can turn off the other side's electricity and water, and uh, that is also a pretty big indicator of me to, to me. Uh, the people in Gaza and the West Bank and Israeli Palestinian uh, Palestinians can't turn off the other side's water, but mm -hmm. constantly live under threat and actually live under that happening. So, uh, if the two of y'all want to go, and then we do have two more speakers and three minutes. So. <laughs> Oh, uh, so I, I come from, I'll just say, a very weird Jewish family. Maybe that's not unusual, but um, I, I didn't really hear much about Israel growing up and really mostly started to learn uh, about Israel and uh, and the Palestinian view of things in the early 2000s, which was another very heated time. Um, and... Uh, I will say that that my major uh, view of things has been that I've always resented the view that if I don't fully toe the the line um, of Israeli state propaganda, that this makes me a bad Jew or a self hating Jew. Uh, I've always really resented that um, because it, it's the only place in Jewish life where you're not encouraged to think for yourself and to hold three different opinions on any given subject. Uh, so yeah, that, that's really how I come to this. My father was a science fiction author. He was actually quite hostile to Israel in the beginning. And then when he realized that it was actually their lives at stake, he kind of softened that position. Um, for me, it's I've read a lot. Some, you know, I've had access to some material that you don't, um, but uh, but even just from the open source material uh, out there from different sources, uh, uh, you know, the key is to get multiple perspectives if you want to try and find out uh, uh, what's what's going on and acknowledge that they're all wrong. You <laughs> <laughs> uh, can do one last question. I'm sorry to the to the last person. So I know you guys talked about a lot about um, IO and like. Um, via like social media and the internet and stuff like that and you know the the fact that uh, a lot of palestinian stuff is being taken down but being that hamas uh hezbollah are both iranian proxies what are your opinions on how effective iran has been in projecting influence uh on the ground through cuts force I mean, i'm probably going into a little bit too much stuff but like through stuff on the ground or in and around uh like syria lebanon and stuff like that um iran does fund hamas mm -hmm. lebanese hezbollah and other entities in the area uh, both their leadership and the leadership of hamas have both admitted that the reason for the attack was because they wanted to sabotage the Abraham Accords. And they, they said it straight out. Um, and this latest sticking point in the uh, ceasefire dialogue is the survival of the Hamas leadership. That's their number one uh, priority there. So that can kind of give you an idea of, of their motivation. Um, the um, Israel, I'm sorry, uh, Iran does have a level of information operations capabilities that they employ, and they have different uh, uh, allies in the region um, who repeat some of their, their uh, materials. But as was described earlier, uh, Israel has, you know, using their own elements of national power, can basically say, hey, do you want to continue transmitting your material into my country? Um, 
you know, getting back in line. Um, and I'm not surprised, uh, uh, given, given the circumstances. Um, but the, um, the level of armament that um, Iran has given to their proxies in, in the area is very significant, which is why we're all holding our breath about what's going to happen with the Lebanese Hezbollah. And I have, uh, I went into Lebanon uh, um, during the last time uh, the Israelis and, and, and Lebanese Hezbollah were, were trading 500 pound bombs. And uh, it was not pretty. Um, I've also been places like uh, 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 Mogadishu, where I see what happens when a society tears itself apart. Um, so it's it's uh, rather um, it's rather devastating. So uh, it, it... yeah, just uh, just one thing to add there. Again, going back to the question of framing, um, you know that th there are a few points in there that I could expand on or or refute. In the interest of time, I'll leave them. But I do want to say that when we think about whether Hezbollah, Hamas, Syria, whether they're Iranian proxies, we should also be thinking about whether Israel is an American proxy, right? We very similarly, we fund them, we provide them weapons support, propaganda support, et cetera. Uh, so it, it's not that it's not a necessarily a question of right and wrong, uh, but Keep that in mind when you're trying to get a more accurate view of the whole situation. Uh, I'm going to leave it at that as our my co-panelists uh, both have other panels to get to. But I want to thank everybody here for a uh, civil conversation, multi-directional, uh, and you know, great job. Very much. Thank you. That's good. Yes.